methodology. A lot of changes. I want you to know that the information is going to come at you a little bit like a flood tonight. Um, frankly, I have four hours of information to present to you in less than a fourth of that time. So I'm going to be doing some uh, cutting. I've already done a bunch of cutting, but I'll be doing some on the fly uh, as we go along. As to questions, please save them for the panel uh, uh, at, the, at the end of the slides. So the changes are a bit of a blur, kind of like that blur. Um, and I'm going to go through them, but I want you to know that uh, Becky is going to have some uh, information, uh, an ability to provide an email for some slides to come to you afterwards if you would like. I want to acknowledge, do you know, even know how we're having this? Becky, those of us who know her know that she's involved in all kinds of things trying to help the investment community here. We were at a debt lending event and there was a conversation with an investor who was looking to buy a package of more than 350 homes. And he'd been working on it literally for two years. And the seller had been stalling and all of a sudden the seller <coughs> wanted to hurry up and sell and he couldn't figure out why. And I began to disclose some of this information I'm about to share with you. And he went, oh my, that's why the seller's doing that. And I made a comment to the investor. I said, this information really needs to get out. And Becky's first response was, I'll sponsor that. And that's how we're here tonight. So let's express gratitude to Becky. So tonight, I'm a parrot. I'm a messenger. The reality is that any one of you in this room a lot of this is public data that you could have dug out yourself. I'm going to share it with you um, and, and understand it's just a portion, but I'm going to act as a messenger, and I ask you to not worry about the messenger, hear the message. Uh, changes made here could affect your fortunes over the last, over the next several years. So Robert Kiyosaki, this statement stuck with me. Money is made through the knowledge of law and taxes. We have law changes, we have tax changes. Um, and the pattern for those who've been around a while is that the laws change, then the funding associated with those uh, transactions change, then the markets change, and then the market ripples out into the future until we have another shift or change. So, I have some unique training. When I first got into real estate in 1977, I went to work for a man by the name of Richard Thompson. He was the only guy in Houston specializing in townhome and condominium failed projects. This was the middle of an absolute boom, and these people were not being successful. And our job was to go in and figure out what the strengths were, minimize the weaknesses, and solve those particular development projects, and it was a great training. So, shifts. You're looking at a man who's been through some shifts, and some of those shifts hit me and my family right upside our heads. Uh, some of those things took uh, not only financial health, but it could, my wife's right here, put a lot of stresses on our marriage. I suggest to you that not moving correctly with the shift can affect your time because you can find your time eaten up by stuff you wish you were not having to work on. Um, and it can affect your reputation. I know a man uh, that has the respect of many here that had 53 houses from Harvey that he got caught with. And his trades, decided that they could make more money with the insurance companies and they walked off the job. That man has been working his way through, but his time has been eaten up with stuff that he would have preferred to have done different. And with that time being eaten up, it's your opportunity cost to make more money. So 
there's some people in this room that are pretty good at chips. And this information can be shared one to another. The reality is I, I visited uh, at uh, Wholescalers Live in October. I met a guy from New York who's pretty involved up there. And he said, you guys share information just openly. Everybody holds their cards up there. They don't share. They don't educate. They don't do free things. I'm told that Dallas has some of those symptoms as well. And, but in Houston, we have an atmosphere. Quest provides us tremendous education to raise the level of all boats, right? All boats rise. So I, would, I need to get your attention here a little bit with some of my own painful experience. I've been in real estate 42 and a half years, and I've missed some ships, and I've optimized them, and I've gotten a little better over time. And I would like to share some thoughts about things my mentors have poured into me. My wife and I have some experience with this flooding stuff. We actually flooded three times in two different homes that were outside the flood plan. And we're gonna talk about some of those stats, some others who share that. I actually, as a result of the 2016 flood, spent most of the last two years in a walker and a wheelchair as a result of throwing my furniture away. Uh, my core muscles are not quite as strong, strong as they used to be. So, um, so I have some things I believe to, to share. So I don't, there's six different categories of people here. Some of them are in this room. Some of them are people you know. They're in real trouble now, but they don't realize they are. They're about to be in trouble, and they don't know that they are. Some of them have an opportunity to escape trouble, but they might not choose to learn what they need to learn, pivot, act, and they're kind of fed up with all the shifts and changes and the stuff that happens. Others will doubt and they'll be skeptical and they'll harden themselves to the facts and they'll pretend it's not there. The problem with what they do is it can affect others, specifically the public. Um, Others will be faced through temptations for shortcuts to deceive, to save themselves while harming others. And there'll be consequences as a result of that. And others of you that are in this room are ready to learn and adapt. You're gonna go, wow, show me where the opportunities are. I, I wanna benefit from this shift. And they'll study and they'll lay hold of the consequences of, of, of conquer the consequences and they'll prosper. So I missed my first shift in the early 80s when Evelyn and I got married. Uh, my uh, wife, it was the first few months, and what happened is um, there was a change in the law that took development funding right out of the market. Uh, almost overnight. And I ended up with 55 accounts of financial pressures, a lot of zeros, and it took me 17 years to repay those funds. I don't want that for anybody in this room. It damaged relationships, it caused fighting between us. Uh, it was so early on in our marriage that there were a lot of relatives, pressures, even to a board one. our son. So the reality is I would not trade anything for the good that came out of that period. I, I found a true relationship with Jesus Christ. I became very motivated to learn. My character was changed. And there was some amazing good that took place. Um, I had represented the custom homes of Cinco Ranch when it originally started. And I got a check from them that paid off 22 of those 55 accounts. It was an amazing, unpredictable, hard to predict. 
And my wife and I ended up with a 4,000 square foot house in Weston Lakes on the golf course that we paid $70,000 for, all in the middle of stress and trauma and challenges and difficulties, five life and death situations with our first three kids. So the two of us became 10. And my why, why did I need to learn? Why did I need to embrace these cotton picking constant changes? Why did I need to figure it out? That's my reason. And mentors taught me that shifts bring opportunities. Oh, and by the way, the 10 became, <laughs> that's 23, and there's two more coming in the spring. And these people are well worth figuring out shifts, and I bet yours are too. So, big pictures about water. But it's not just about water, the scale of the water, the depth of the water, the velocity of the water. But it's also about 669 square miles of um, jurisdiction to deal with. Um, Houston 669, you realize what Dallas 386, New York 468, Chicago. So Harris County is 1,777 square miles. And Rhode Island, the whole state, is only 1,212. So our elected officials and the people who are not elected but are employed, what I'm going to show you is I believe we should all be grateful for the work they've done and for how they've arrived at things. Um, some of them may be kicking and screaming, but the reality is a lot of good has been developed for the citizenry of Harris County and uh, the Houston area. So we're projected to become 10,000, excuse me, 10 million in the eight county region by 2045. And Metro shows us, if you look right here, that's the population density in 2010. This is what they predict in 2040. And they can follow uh, land that's been bought for development. They can follow, they have a lot of amazing statistics, and look at our job density. So, so with jobs and people comes congestion, right? And by the way, the roads, that's how we process water. That's how we move water. Its design is to go to the street. That's why we're not supposed to park in the street. It's designed to move the water to Galveston. <coughs> So out of Harvey, there were 365,000 damaged homes. What you're going to find out is uh, there were not a lot of permits uh, that came as a result. And that's being addressed. So I would call this a big picture. So we have a whole lot of people, a lot of drainage issues, a lot of legal engineering and rainfall issues. This is going to be like if you if you took a helicopter and flew up above the big problem and you look down at the pieces of it and you see this gear working against that gear, that's the purpose of this chart. So our officials recognize that what they're doing now is establishing precedence for the future. Um, they understand that we're going to have massive population growth. It's just going to continue. And with that is construction growth. And that creates situations because the water's got to flow downhill, right, on flat land. So the city's published mission is to keep people safe. And their policies have to reflect that. So I want you to understand the changes that are taking place are based on people living on that. They don't want that on their conscience. They don't want the legal liability for it. Um, the other thing to note is that we have an aging infrastructure and we really don't have a plan to replenish the streets. Roads have a, a, a lifespan and what's supposed to happen is every so many years you're supposed to, to uh, replenish them. Uh, we don't really have a political will to cause that to happen. 
Then the experts are documenting, and I'm going to show you a chart, that rainfall is increasing all across the United States. There's a shift going on from a rainfall standpoint. We don't know if it's a short-term thing. These things have happened in history. But it is increasing risk to human beings. My wife and I, in the first flood, and granddaughters and so on, were taken out in the boat. That's not a fun experience. I'm to mess with you a little bit. I'm grateful that we live in a community where people will go buy a boat, a motor, and a trailer so that they can help people. That's the quality of where we live. And I don't know another city like that in the United States and frankly anywhere in the world. It's amazing. And it lays the groundwork for some good to happen ahead. So we have a bunch of timelines merging together. We have insurance timelines. We have um, uh, some mapping that's coming. We have a lot of things <coughs> that are kind of, they, they're not all going to come together at once. And just as soon as people think one storm of change has passed, there's another one right behind it. And they're just charting that I'm going to talk about some of those charts. Amazing that local, state, and national politics came together at one time. When, what can we name where that has happened? It took the crisis for the various jurisdictions to say, uh, we have to do something. All of Houston, all of Harris County was affected. The, our officials estimate that it would take $50 billion to solve the problem. And there's not a supply of $50 billion. There's pieces, but there's not the full supply. And as to the future, our officials are saying there's going to be future floods, and we're going to need FEMA money. So we've got to cooperate with FEMA in order to make sure that money comes. So a lot of dynamics, a lot of cooks in the kitchen, if anybody knows that old saying, making the recipe. Army Corps, I, I won't get into all that. This, I'm going to tell you that some of these slides, I'm going to do almost like a movie. They're going to go three seconds, and they're going to go. So don't be upset with me. I'm warning you now. So this is the city's role, and it has to do with adjusting from, from current design standards to new design standards. One of those things is your culverts in your front yard that used to be fine at 18 inches. They have mandated that it will be 24 inches from now on. So the county roll, we've got some bond eyesight because this is an important slide. So this shows us where the water, water issues are, big picture. And the future that has already begun, this map is going to change. And I'm going to talk about that. And I'm going to talk about how that might create opportunities for the investors in this room. OK. Oh, Becky. <laughs> She's working on it. She knew it was frozen? OK. So I don't tap dance, guys, especially with the gimp leg. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can, I can, Bob. <laughs> Becky, I have no movement. Oh, that's my fault. <laughs> Thank you. The sound went out on the Facebook live. So apologies to everybody listening. Hopefully it's back on. Right now. Ah. All right. <laughs> So the reality, I've already said, the real cost to fix the problem is $50 billion. Thank you, Derek. Hang on, let me do something real quick. Sorry. Can you talk about this slide, or do you want to go to the next one? Um, this is about some of our government funding, and I'm not going to get lost in this. Let it suffice to say, at the local level, at the state level, and at the national level, our cries have been heard, and there is additional funding that has come. What you're going to learn is 
the thimble is not as large as the 55 gallon drum of money that's needed. I'm not going to despise the thimble. We need every thimble we can and it will change the problem. Somebody the other day was telling me that, you know, why are you standing on the seashore throwing starfish back into the water? You can't do that. Why would you waste your time to do that? And the response was, I can save that one. I can save that one. And I feel like our thimbles are going to be like that. So Proposition 8 got passed. Um, this is something called Chapter 19. This is part of our qualifying to be able to get the money that we need. There's a direct connection to submitting to the changes in the law. So we talked about Harris County has a lot to the north, doesn't it? So here's an interesting thing. Look at the first column or second column, Harvey impacted. Citywide, 149,576 houses. Structures, actually. Out of that, over 90,000 were outside the floodplain. My wife and I, two properties, didn't require flood insurance, outside the floodplain. It's enough to make some people say, I don't want to hang out with you, Richard. So what that documents is that the mapping that we have to date is very, very inaccurate. You're going to find out in a minute that out of the more than 2,500 miles of bios and streams and creeks and all of that in our market, less than half of that has ever been mapped. It's never been mapped. So there are a lot of insurance decisions and real estate decisions that are being made without the information. Okay? Anybody, does that surprise anybody? That's how you end up with 90,000 properties that were not in the floodplain, flood. Or at least that's part of it. So let me just go deeper in. Why do we flood? Well, we got some clay that doesn't absorb water very much. Uh, anybody recognize that we don't have too many ski resorts? We're, we're pretty flat. Um, the other thing is 79% of Houston was built before engineering understood what floodplain management might look like for today's era. So as a result of that, we're not structured correctly. And then our pipes, uh, you're gonna see something in a little while about the changes in culverts. If you go to get a driveway permit, I want you to know it's not like yesterday. New changes that affect you in getting a driveway permit. So this is switchgrass. In the Katy Prairie, we don't have a lot of that in the Heights, right? We, we don't, Garden Oaks, we don't, we don't, League City, we probably don't have a lot of that, right? We don't have any more the kind of, um, of organics that capture the water. So they believe that there's stronger storms ahead than the ones we already have. And it's pretty stated, we talked about this earlier, I saw some hands, development's not gonna stop, is it? And a lot of it is gonna be north of us. And they're gonna have to figure out north of us how to get that water downhill without destroying the people in between. Um, FEMA maps. Missed 75% of the Houston flood damage claims between 99 and 2009. Chronicle examined more than 36,000 severe repetitive losses. I know of a house that flooded seven times. 
Uh, uh, what I understand from officials is that they have houses that seven or eight hundred thousand dollars have been spent on the repetitive repair of the homes and the house is only worth a hundred thousand dollars. Now that's not good use of money, is it? But to the credit of our officials, they appealed to FEMA and said, look, your standards say we have to put the house back exactly white like it was. But that's a problem, guys, because if you do that, you're going to continue with repetitive loss. Why don't we spend that money differently and prevent the repetitive loss? And the city won that appeal. So rainfall. This is what they calculate off in the red columns. I've been here since 72. This was, this was Alicia. I mean, Allison, not Alicia. I was written for that too. Uh, this is what Harvey showed in 24 hours. We're not structured. Our math is not structured for that. Look at the county in terms of how the rainfall estimates you see up in the Northwest it's less. Imelda, that little event that happened recently, I was shown that if it had moved four miles, we would have had more flooding than we had in Harvey. Isn't that crazy? That's how close we got to a greater mess. So rainfall increases. They've been documenting this. This is kind of like a big picture. I, I get irritated with some of the environmental stuff where somebody takes a very short window of time and that short window doesn't compare to a longer period of time. But this is since 91. I, I got family up in Maine. Look at what's going on in the Northeast. So, Big first thing to announce. We all lived under a standard that said, I don't need flood insurance if my top of slab is at least a hundred feet plus one. Everybody remember that? Wipe it out of your mind. It no longer exists. There is no hundred year floodplain anymore. It is now the 500 year floodplain. And we're going to be changing our business practices as a result. And we should be selecting our properties differently. And we should be disposing of some things unless we want to pay insurance. Um, in your left column, there's a lot of property in the Houston area that's four feet below the standard of the 500 year floodplain. Those folks are going to be paying $9,500 a year, translation $800 a month for flood insurance. So an investor who used to think, oh, it flooded, I don't want to sell it right now because it's kind of got a bad reputation, I'm going to hold it. I want you to know that if you're not careful, you're going to be holding a property that's going to cost you $800 a month just in flood insurance. Now that's real. Now, graciously, that's going to go up over a four year period of time. They're actually gonna take your existing policy, they're gonna take it to where it's going, but they're going to raise it 25% a year. Okay? So uh, it's still got a lot of shock and awe. It's still got a lot of pain to it. This is relevant to the 500 years. To the 500, not the 100. So you're going to need to be two feet above the 500. And you're going to need to know where the 500 is. So we're all going to be buying elevation certificates. And we're all going to want our surveys to identify where the 500 is. We're all going to be doing that. So are they remapping this now? It's all in the process of being remapped into 
and to uh, people in the engineering world, we have a mapping system that is world-class, state-of-the-art that's being operated right now. And the test for the, literally for the world, is right here in Houston, right where we had the need. And that mapping is, has got a timeline in terms of providing the data. And I'll get into that in a slide. So that's a, that's a great question, but it's coming to a theater near you. Elevation certificate from now on. Most of us never bought them. Didn't want to pay the money. Felt like it was a waste of money. I'm going to come into it in the slides. Okay. So NFIP, National Flood Insurance Program. It's broke. It's messed up. Do you know that our political officials have really done well for us? because they have kept our rates about 15% below market by their negotiations with other states. We've actually been subsidized. We've actually been subsidized and it's kept our rates lower. I'm grateful for that, but that is all changed. Um, I've already talked about this essentially 20% of the claims from outside the flood area. So what's next? Everybody smiling? <laughs> I didn't see anybody get up and leave the room, so I'm grateful for that. Um, we've got a bunch of stuff ahead. We have new maps you're going to hear in the news. FIRMS. That's our flood insurance rate maps. That's, that's the new stuff that's coming. Elevation grids, uh, integrate that over time technology improves and it brings benefit to us. And like I said, that's going on right here in our town. Um, so here's a map that, uh, or here's a chart that would be good to take a picture of because it's got deadlines and time frames. So if you notice in 2019, the models and mapping have kicked off and begun. In April of this year, the new flood insurance rates, just the rates are going to be announced on properties. Some of you, I've talked to many, who have bought property recently and they're seeing increases in their flood insurance rates they're seeing increases in their insurance rates across the board. FEMA's gonna get that money back. They're gonna refill that bucket. And um, in October of this year, the first rates, the increased rates will begin and people will start paying the, ha the higher rate. That, so, what does that say to you as a flipper, as a, as a friend or a family member of others? You might want to consider, when I show you some of the disclosures, you might want to consider disposing of some properties before April, if you can, when it becomes public knowledge. April of 2021? No, April of this year. Like, tomorrow. Like, hurry up. <clears throat> And I'm going to show you in a minute the significance of what I'm saying. I'm not in any way, if you listen to me, I'm not trying to frighten anybody. I don't want to scatter. I, what I want to do is to think methodically, logically, and purposefully through a set of problems that none of us remember standing in line for. Right? None of us expected that we were going to deal with this. But I believe, yes, sir. Uh, this particular chart, uh, this is part of the firm, uh, the firm map, the, the new mapping system. This is their schedule, and it goes into how they have to present their initial 
and then there's public review and comment, and then they have several fudge factors in there as to when it may actually publish. It's already started. Uh, flood insurance rate map system. It's the new technology. So, this isn't going to be like your favorite thing, but it's got to happen. It's, it's the medicine we didn't want to take, but we need to take it. So, this is how water, these are the watersheds for our area. All that water has to get down to Galveston Bay, right? This is the path. This is how it gets there. Look at our budget for the city. This little sliver right here of $10 million. Notice that's the smallest sliver. That's our budget for storm water in Houston. So there's not a lot of money for some of the things that need to be done. And this may need to be influenced. As a people, we may need to influence that budget to increase. I already told you this about the 2,500 miles. So our minimum detention requirements are, have increased already. So this affects developers, but I know lots of people who are being told that on their single family lot, they're being required to provide a drainage plan, which costs them some money, specifically a rehabber who didn't put that as a line item in his budget. The other thing you're gonna find out that goes with this is that you wanna be very careful when you market something and say, room for a pool because that becomes something that you cannot have water drain off, right? That's a hardscape item. So the city could prevent that from happening. Do you see where you might could have liability in the future because you represented that it had room for a pool, but because of the new guidelines, the city's not going to allow that pool. Some people, when they go to get a driveway, are going to find out, let's say they were going to replace the driveway, or they were going to expand the driveway, or they were going to put a circle drive in. What they're going to find is it's going to violate um, uh, the, what's the word? <laughs> um, uh, impervious surface. That's it. Thank you very much on the tip of my tongue. So, pervious means it drains, right? Gravel does that. Yes, sir? Yes, soaks into the ground. I, I like plain English. Thank you. So, asphalt doesn't allow that. Concrete doesn't allow that. So, what we may find is that the material used for a driveway May have to change and you you've already seen you've seen a lot of the black rubber and other materials that's what they're dealing with that's why that's happening it's it's not the new cool thing it's the solution to the guidelines being provided so anybody ever seen a drain drains to galveston bay that's what we're doing so it used to be, oh, by the way, when you go to do the driveway, we used to be able to do 18 inch culverts, right? That's gone. It's all now 24 inch culverts. If you go to fix that driveway, the city's going to make you take that culvert up and put a 24 inch in its place. And you can just expect that. And that's not free. Um, Open ditches I'll talk about in a minute. What I hear in the background, I have friends that are legislators. Uh, we've got more regulation coming. Uh, what does government do if it's the pendulum on a clock? It swings one way and it reacts and swings maybe too far the other way. So stay tuned. 
So chapter 19, this is part of what we have to uh, stay submitted to in order to get our FEMA money. It's what qualifies us for flood insurance. Understand folks, there'll be a lot of people without that NFIP with the National Flood Insurance Program. They'd be destroyed. There's a lot of people in our community that have already been destroyed. Um, at the time of Harvey, 83% of all of the 1.4 million buildings in Harris County did not have flood insurance. I've already said it cost 15% less. All right, so the next seven slides. If you've been hanging on going, okay, I, I gotta go, I got kids to tuck in, whatever that is. If you listen to the next seven slides, you'll get a big chunk of the meat of it and you'll understand what you need to tell to your, your family, your friends, um, what you need to tell your in-laws, what you need to tell your friends in the business. So I've already told you the hundred has now become 500 plus two. If you're top of slab, is not 500 plus two, you will be participating in the flood insurance program. Your mortgage company will require it. Our rates used to be mild. I don't consider $9,500 a year mild. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So here's the, the crux of it. Here's the pain of it. They're going to publish based on the current maps, which we've already proven are wrong. And then they're going to republish after they're changed. So some people are going to face discouragement when they think they already had the worst case scenario. And they're going to find that maybe there was a worse worst case scenario. No, based on the new technology and the new mapping that's taking place. Okay, so they can only use what they have now. The new mapping, including the, the 1,250 miles that were never mapped. Uh, no, that's only the insurance rates. That's, and they're having to do that off the existing maps. Okay. 2021-2022. Depending on how much public hearings and how much pushback and there will be anybody ever attended an eviction court, right? So if you ever had somebody be emotional, you were evicting them and they were talking about a lot of things that had nothing to do with the lease, right? And the judge ruled based on the lease, not all the emotional stuff. We're going to have a lot of emotional stuff ahead that won't have anything to do with how the system works. And the system is going to be, it, it's gonna be unemotional and it's going to have to. So, Flood insurance were rate were, were mild. They're not going to be mild. The $9,500 a year is real. So somebody who was operating the Burr method and they're making 400 a month positive could find themselves 400 in the negative. But I want you to listen to the worst of that. We live in social media, right? So do you think certain neighborhoods are going to maybe come, become radioactive? They are, folks. They are. Remember the pendulum swing? It swings too far. People, people tend to overreact. Hi, Pat. <laughs> they tend to overreact. 
uh, repeat your question. Rental rates. Rental rates are going to be affected in those neighborhoods because who wants to live in a flooded house, right? In addition to that, um, aren't property values based on precedent? Our laws are based on a lot of precedent, right? What do, what do lawyers argue? So what's going to happen is when the appraisals go to be done in a neighborhood, they're going to use the recent sales, right? They're looking for four sales, 15% of the square footage up or down, a, a, an age range, right? They're going to be looking for that. So what if you have a subdivision that's 50% under the 500 and the rest of it is marginal or out? What do you think is going to happen in that neighborhood? How many of you have family members that need to know this? Okay. I'm going to point you to tools because I want you to warn your family members. I mentioned this earlier, that a lot of people in our industry have done very well over the years re rehabbing um, properties that have flooded multiple times. I'm going to caution my private lender friends to be very careful about that because the, the, um, the Facebook, the, the social media stuff is going to affect values very quickly. And what if your um, median income person, um, you're just kind of don't have a lot of money saved, but you pay your bills, you go to work every day, and now all of a sudden you're faced with 500 bucks, a or excuse me, with 800 bucks a month that was not part of your budget, we're gonna have some people that will either lose their houses or walk away from their houses, okay? And, I, and again, I, I, I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to see cause and effect. I, I don't, so. In the past, people held for rental. They said, I'll just wait till the tide turns. I'll just wait until the reputation, the stigma of the neighborhood changes. If that neighborhood now requires a lot of those folks to pay $9,500 a year for their insurance, is that stigma going to go away in a short time? I really don't think so. I don't think I can, I don't think I have a mathematical or logical model to say that that's going to happen. Permits. So most rehabbers have gotten along without paying a lot of attention to permits. I've heard guys, oh, you know, forget that. I don't pay attention to that. But if you listen to the folks inside the city, they will tell you that they are now, when a property changes hands, they're going to require the closing out of the old permits. So let's walk through what that, that scenario might look like. Um, you go to buy this house and you assume everything's okay and you don't check the permits. You want to turn on gas and water with the city. And the city says, well, I need you to close out those permits. And you say, well, that was the seller's responsibility. They didn't take care of it. No, sir, that's now your responsibility because you didn't make the seller take care of that. Oh, but that plumber's not even in business anymore. How do I possibly solve that? The city's going to require you to open that permit again, take it all the way through the process and solve it. That could be very expensive. Very expensive. Um, yes, that that's an oh wow. 
Well, I'm going to get into some realtors are using this to negotiate and to get advantage over sellers. I'm going to go into that slide in a minute. But I'm going to tell you, you want to pay attention, please, to permits. My lender friends in the room, that might be something that you want to pay attention to before you agree to lend money on a property. In fact, I, I'll go beyond might. I would strongly encourage you to consider that. Um, brokers, if you know the one to four family Texas promulgated contract, paragraph 7F says that the seller represents that old, that the permits have been taken care of, that there's not unpermitted work, right? Well, you're going to find out there's a whole lot of work been done in this city that was not permitted. You'll, you'll, I've got the stats for you. Um, and that's going to be properties that we're going to be looking at. We're, we're going to have friends that think they bought the deal of their lifetime only to find out how toxic, toxic that property is. It could, it could be permit and it could also be $9,500 a year insurance. Somebody started to ask a question. Well, if, if you have a property that's been approved or whatever, right, or renovated, and the permits were never filed for, how are you going to figure that out? You're, you're going to have to start again is what the city says. Well, how about the city? Gas. <laughs> yeah, gas and water. And they're going to know that it's sold. You're going to go to apply for new permits. That's a trigger. You are the new owner. Well, I know, but you I'm, want gas and water in your name. I understand that, but let, let's say you got somebody that had a two-bedroom home and they added on a third bedroom and didn't didn't put in permits on it. Okay, and the county never knew about it. They never knew about it. They just did it. And you didn't know about it. You bought it. How are they going to catch you? So you're talking about the unpermitted work that was done and nobody knows about it. What I'm describing is the stuff where permits were opened and were never closed. Okay. And, so the way and I'm going to tell you that paragraph 7F is being used in negotiations because in the buying process, the buyer is figuring out that there's unpermitted work that was never asked for. And I'm going to describe to you that that's being used as a negotiating tool. Okay. Literally, the day before closing, realtors are being taught to say, we, we, we checked all this out. Uh, we discovered this permitting situation and that the permitting was not closed out the way it was supposed to. We'd like a $10,000 discount because we don't know what it's going to take to fix all this. And it seems like it's going to be big and they're going to want a fudge factor built into that. And that's going on for real right now. Yes, sir. That's a great beneficial insight. Thank you for that. That's a great. Yes, Mike. It, on some of this stuff, it could be a drop in the bucket. So some will view this when they go to buy property. They'll want to play this card. Other people are going to face being hit with this card. No, sir, not yet. But what's going on is our counties tend to copy each other, right? So my thought is Fort Bend is probably the next one. I can't give you specifics, but that seems to be a pattern I've seen in over time. Pat Duggan may be able to comment on that. 
So Pat's a developer over here many, many years, and he's saying he agrees that, that Fort Bend is probably a, a likely candidate. Surveys. From now on, you want a elevation certificate, and on your survey, you're going to want to identify where the 500 is. You want to verify that your top of slab is two feet above. Now, we already know the data that insurance is using is wrong. We flooded a bunch of properties that weren't supposed to flood. I resemble that remark twice. So, do you realize that if you have an elevation certificate, you might be able to negotiate with your insurance company because you've got a stamp sealed document that tells them they're wrong. And you might not have to pay the money that they would like to solicit from you. Yes, Mike. What about with your developing properties and they're building their lots up four feet, five feet? How does that affect all the other people down the street? Uh, they're working with the county or with the city. Remember, our roads are what drain water. That's the path. That's what sends it into the underground stormwater system and all of that. They are subject to the county, for, to the flood control management office. Of, uh, and all of that design is supposed to intertwine with how it affects our neighbor downhill. Pat, would you have anything to add to that? You don't do any infill? Okay. Ultimately, they're raising, they are raising the, here, I, I haven't even gotten to that yet. Okay. We're going to have people who are going to be in a situation where they will literally be forced to raise their slab. Okay and there won't be a way around it. Yes. Okay, so my family lives in Louisiana and their house definitely flooded the year before Harvey. So my concern is, are similar things like this going to be in place over there? I have no idea. So she asked a question. She said, she's got people she cares for in Louisiana and they definitely deal with a pattern of flooding. And she's asking, is it, coming to a theater near her with her family, is it going to happen with them? And I, I, don't, I don't have a response to that. I don't, it's not my database. Right, well, I'm, I'm just curious because I know like the year before Harvey hit us, like the, their house was four feet of water for several months. So I'm very concerned right now for them. So this was, the, I alluded to this a minute ago. So the city has taken a position that beginning September 1, 2018, okay, year and a half ago, that all permitted work becomes cumulative. And if that permitted work exceeds $10,000, then it throws you into a special category. The special category talks about substantial damage. Substantial damage is where if the value of the property, if the value of the work you want to do is more than 50% of the value of the improvements, then you'll be required to raise the slab. Even if, Even if it's not, and that's why I use the example of hail damage and kitchen fire. So somebody could have hail damage or kitchen fire, and the work permitted work that is required to be done in the city, over 100 square feet on your roof, that, that's got to be permitted. So what individuals are going to face is that as a result of Harvey, as a result of the 2016 floods as well, HCAD 
has taken the value of the improvements of many of the homes, let's say it's worth 300,000 total, they make the improvements 20,000 and they make the land 280,000. So if you're a flipper, when you go to look at property, please understand what you could face. So in my example, 20,000 is what they are now for tax value calling the improvements. So $10,500 worth of permitted work, $10,001 of permitted work is going to exceed 50% of the improvements. And they will now require in order to get gas and water, they will require the slab to be raised to two feet above the 500. And this is, I'm, I told you, I warned you, there's some stuff ahead. But how can they change the value of the improvements versus the land? They can just arbitrarily do this? They have, arbitra they have arbitrarily done it based on uh, resale value in that area. That's why some flippers go, man, I want that property. Because, you know, the lot's worth that. I'm practically getting the house for free. Fabiana, is that what you've seen? Yeah. Yes, sir. Omar. Galveston County, we come across some properties that are being wholesale, and the city won't let you rip them no more. And wholesalers are pushing them out, saying cheap, really cheap, but you cannot rip those that house anymore because the same thing, the same rule falls into it. And I, I've seen it several times already. Where's that? Galveston That's County. Galveston. That's all yeah. from Dickinson, Dickinson. League City, Dickinson. Yeah. Yeah. So they'll let you sell it, but then they can't, they won't let you dig up it? Well, they will if you raise it to the level. So what you just did is sign yourself financially into a mess. Actually, uh, I've been working with a mastermind group. Hector is part of that. W one of the things we did is we had an engineer come and meet with us who has raised houses and dealt with these kinds of things. And what we find are quotes between $100,000 and $180,000 to raise one house. So, so to some people we love, it'll destroy them. It will destroy them financially. Yes, sir. There is. We affectionately call them mountaintops. You won't find a ski lodge there, but we, we call them mountaintops, and they could be four and a half foot high. Yes, sir. No, we're going to go deeper into that. We actually have a meeting coming up with someone else who has a, a very good reputation and we'll, we'll have some more information. Our, our mission with what we're doing, I, I got stirred that I just needed to share this with people I knew. That's how this all got started. Then somebody I know said, Richard, you need to do more with this. And some of my friends have urged that we go further. And so part of what we're doing is looking for properties to buy and to hold as a result. The third thing that we're doing, and I was gonna to come to that later, in case somebody leaves, if you know somebody, this is the third part of our mission, if you know somebody who's stuck, who doesn't have the money to fix it, they're, they're upside down, they're faced with raising the slab, all of those things that to most of us seem impossible, I'm gonna want you to email and connect us to those problems. I have no idea what we can actually do, but we're gonna to try to find out if we can. So there's people, we live in a community 
I, I've discussed this with people. I had a great conversation back in October with a, a uh, investor from New York City. He said, you guys, you're, you're not like anything I've ever, I've been involved in Europe and all kinds. He said, you guys educate you raise the level of one another. He said in New York City, everybody's very guarded with the information they have and they don't want anybody else to know what they do. I got family that live in Dallas, but he said, this is anecdotal, but he said in Dallas, it's more toward New York than it is toward Houston. He said in Houston, you guys help each other. You guys share information and contacts with each other. And my response was, yes, we live in a town where guys will not sit and watch TV while other people hurt. They will take their own money, go buy a boat, a trailer, and a motor, and go help people they don't know. And frankly, I'm glad to live in that place. So what we want to do, we want to connect J.J. Watt's money, donated money, to people who need it. We want to locate, the mother of invention, right, is need. We'd like to find somebody who's figured out how to raise slabs without spending $180,000 to do it. And if you know some people who have some creative answers, we want to help connect need to supply and we would welcome that by email by card to hector to me i'll provide you the contact information in the end but those are our four purposes that's what we're doing so floodplain management office is responsible for all permitting of construction activity right all of these details that i won't bore you with. I'm going to check what the time is and check with the, the head guy over there. We're good. Got 15 more minutes? 14 more minutes to be specific. All right. So I've already talked about the $10,000 uh, permit or, or threshold on permits. Um, I've already talked about the 500 year. Can I tell you something? We don't have to do this again. I'm going to provide you a contact information. And if you would like the slides, I'll be glad to share them with you. But here's the condition. You need to pay it forward and help other people with it. That's the condition. We talked about that. Permitting. Remember I said there were that many properties that were uh, damaged in Harvey? Only 5,200 properties were permitted wow. and only 1,991 were finaled. More than 145,000, only 5,200 permitted and less than 2,000 finalized. So if you recognize change might create opportunity, you might be able to play this card and use it. But the big thing I'm here about tonight is to keep you from being run over by this card. Um, I, we don't have time to go into that. Is there an appeal process? I'm a widow and this is all I have and all my equities in the house. Do I have a right to appeal? Well, I, in my opinion, in our government, that widow really should have that right of appeal. But you have to understand that what they're dealing with is precedent. So if you ever heard the term, if it's good enough for the goose, it's good enough for the gander, right? Yeah. So they have to be very careful about precedent and what it causes in the law. 
some of us who've been in the business in a while recognize that in subdivisions, <laughs> if a subdivision HOA does not enforce its restrictions and somebody in the neighborhood gets away with XYZ and it's documented for a period of years, it undermines that whole HOA legally. So if you're doing construction and remodeling and you're using HAR contracts and state promulgated contracts, I encourage you to use this form 303. In the pink here, in Texas, under Texas property code, sellers are required to provide a seller's disclosure of property condition. I want you to see by percentage how much has changed and I want you to see that it's all about floodplain. And sellers are not going to be able to say, duh, I, I, I didn't know. Oh, shucks. They're not going to be able to do that. And if you read this, the all oh, shucks is not going to work. And in Texas, Trouble damages for fraud under the Deceptive Trade Practices Act. Treble damages. I would never want somebody to get stuck with that yet. And this is the third page. This is on page four at the top. This is all about flood as well. So everybody heard about they let the flood, they let the water out at, at the George Bush Reservoir. This is, there are a whole lot of subdivisions. I actually was involved in some things that were built up against um, that reservoir. And those little details were in the fine print of the mud disclosures. So these neighborhoods have seen a drop in value. In fact, some of them are really struggling to resale properties that have been fixed up very, very nicely. You will need an elevation certificate. Um, here's what an elevation certificate looks like. Um, it goes into what the base flood elevation is. You want more than a survey from now on. And I want you to think logically. We only have so many survey companies. They're not used to doing elevation certificates. When now everybody wants an elevation certificate, plus the people who haven't even sold their home want people, they want elevation certificates. It could affect how soon you get that. Could it be beneficial before April to have an elevation certificate to fight back against the changes in insurance rates. And the reality is it, it will go all the way to October because it's not going to be implemented until October. It's just going to be announced in April. And probably in March, there'll be some leaks. Has that anybody ever seen leaks? <laughs> so um, changes to the building code. Next time, next month, commercial. Hector has invited me to come back next month and we'll go more into the permitting. Um, next month, actually is Becky back there? Becky. Becky, could we do the little dog and pony show here? A little bit about using the tools? Right now? Yeah. And we still got seven or eight minutes if you all can handle. What I'd like to do is show you some new tools. And what I want to suggest to you is, you know how airlines, they have a pilot's checklist before they fly? Yep. I'm going to suggest to you that if from now on you'll use these tools before you ever get all excited about a property, <coughs> if you will check it about flooding first, all right? you'll not waste a lot of time on something that you thought was the greatest deal you've seen in your life. Okay. You'll preserve yourself 
or your friends from trouble. So maybe maybe you're Smarter gonna try to link. You're gonna try to link right from here. Oh, hello. Can I do dance hits, anyone? I guess that's the music we were listening to. That's my cue. <laughs> I, I understand that we have some amazing tools that, that do topography. Yeah. yeah, they're using it to find things that have been buried, old cities, all that kind of stuff. Some of them are using it to find buried treasure, literally. Yes. You mean the renovation certificate for the house to live in or for investment? If you know that you know that you're 500 plus two, you you won't need it. But if you think it's sketchy, I would encourage you order it, get it done, put it in place. I would suggest to you that that elevation certificate will be a tool. In the future, if you go to sell that property, it will be a nice exhibit attached to your listing. Yes, Mike. Is that Harris County or in Houston? Also? Harrison City of Houston. So where would you, how would you even go about finding out what your elevation certificate is at You have to go to somebody who has the equipment to do it. Oh, oh, no, no, no. I'm actually about to give you a tool that will give you a clue as to what it is now. So everybody write down Walter P. Moore. It's actually flood slash Walter P. Moore. Okay. It's flood. A glare, so I'm, I'm trying to look at what I'm doing. Yeah, it's, it's flood slash Walter P. Moore. Are you able to type it? Wasn't that first it, floodplain elevation right there? Well, you need flood slash Walter P. Moore. So Walter P. Moore is an engineering firm that has taken on this task to identify and this tool, you'll be able to plug in an address and look at what they document current elevations are. So it's flood slash Walter P as in Paul, Moore, M-O-O-R-E. Seems to be pretty credible. And what you're going to see. I'm not sure if I remember. You, you have to register, no, but it's free. Yeah, you, it is free, but you do have to register. Let's see. If, if this doesn't work, then I'll let you do it. Okay. Okay. So I can't so see. Type in your, I know, just type in your email address. Do you mean you don't remember your password? <laughs> hey, it's take me a few tries. <laughs> <laughs> too, way too many passwords. Password right now. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's why I just let my computer remember and for me. Yeah. Okay, we're in. So this is only for the Houston area. Yeah, that's the boundaries. So go to eighteen eleven Gardenia. Okay, so see up in the corner. I'm typing in an up address. Up here. We're going to type in an address. Eighteen eleven. 1811 Gardenia. Okay, uh, take the map wider. So here's what you're going to see. This color means you're out. That's a good color. But here's TC Jester. Okay. See the bio? You might notice a bunch of streets and houses that are all in. So there's somebody I love and care for in this community that I'm concerned about their value. So there's two schools of thought, and I don't know how to tell you how it's going to play out. But it could be that the mountaintop is going to become greatly valued because people want to live in this location. 
And it could be that the values in the whole neighborhood will be forever changed. Yeah, so would you open the legend, Becky? Uh, the map up there is, I mean, the, there you go. So here's the legend, and we're going to show you another one, but it goes into, you want to be in the 2% chance. That's the 500 year. So um, this zone VE is the worst. Um, this green right here is actually saying it's right at it. This property is out. This is in, this is way in. Okay. Can we do the GIS? Go on explore. Repeat the question. That's not the plus two on that map, is it? No. Yeah. So now there's another source that the city uses. I'm going to, when she gets done with this, I'll quickly give you a slide that has uh, links that you all should take pictures of, or I'll email you the, the slides up to this point, and you can use the tool. Texas A&M created another website you can write down www.buyers be where, like W-H-E-R-E. -E. Where are the buyers, right? Buyers be where, be where. So here's what's happening that I couldn't get into. The insurance is changing. They used to kind of use a, a roller brush and they would t say this area is such and such. But how many know that what's just above that property might affect whether or not that individual house floods? So the insurance company have wisened up and what they're doing is similar to what those of us who are parents uh, learned a long time ago. My 16 year old son's car insurance is much higher than my 16 year old daughter right? So that's what they're doing house by house. And the buyer's beware is doing a risk assessment under four categories. And they actually are going to label it. So right here, it's only here for Harris County and Galveston right now. So you're not going to get Fort Bend, you're not going to get Montgomery County. Um, so do 1811 Gardenia again, just show a parallel. <laughs> You'll see a parallel. If I had more time, I would have started taking addresses out of the audience. That's what I actually intended to do. Yeah. All right. So there's the subdivision. You're going to do a visual comparison to what you just saw a minute ago. She's going to click on the blue dot. Okay, here's the risk score. So you want to be 1.0 bright green. You're going to get the best insurance rates. Great tool. And you can use this to assess before you ever buy a property. How reliable do you, you say this tool is? It's current state of the art, I mean, that I know of. But, but remember, it's also of, changing, right? So it there's, is changing. And we we were at the at, at the city one of the city's uh, meetings uh, right. a few weeks ago, and and uh, it was really sad. I mean, and we were asking them why is it that you only have? I mean, the city's putting something together, and they had maybe what was it, 30, 40 people, Richard, uh, and they don't really. They had four million dollars to. Uh, to work on, on some issues on the floor, and they were asking, you know, where do you think we can get it? No, it's I, 61 million. 61 and another 61 one, yeah. Million, yeah. Um, and, and we have, I mean, as, as Houston, you know, like with the situation we have with the flood, uh, FEMA or, or the federal government allocates a lot of money 
uh, to fix a lot of those problems. So we're going to be talking some more about resilient projects and about other things. So uh, how this money is allocated, a lot of the information that you will, it'll be able, it's, it's general, but then how it translates for you to benefit. So do you guys know that knowledge is power? Okay, but knowledge plus action, right? Because knowledge alone, I mean, knowing something doesn't mean anything if we don't do something about it. So I want to say thank you, Richard, for putting all this together. So it, it took a lot of work, and, and thank you for your heart of sharing it. Uh, so not asking for any money. We're not asking, you know, like to pay for anything at this point. We are just doing the research. We're working on that. We'll, you know, Richard put a lot of time, a lot of effort. We're trying just to collaborate. Uh, Becky and I are part of that, trying to collaborate on, on how we can bring you something that is going to make you a better investor. How are you going to be safer putting your money in there? We couldn't really uh, finish everything. It's, it's, it's very short time. This should be a four or six hour uh, right. workshop to really go through the, the entire thing. But um, that's why we were talking about it and said, we'll do next month. So had, are you guys in for next month? Yeah. All right, and maybe you have to bring somebody that really need to hear some of this and you know, how am I gonna really take this information and really translate it into make it profitable or at least keep my money safe, right? So it's, it's part of all that. Um, you're gonna get all this. So I know that you were worried, worried, trying to take some pictures, and it's really good information. So um, Becky's gonna tell you how to. Do you want to take the mic and tell them how to get the? So oh. also, guys. So you'll get you'll get this picture, and you'll get the entire presentation. Also, remember to if you want to ask us questions, either to Becky or to my meetup or the Facebook that information that we have from us or for Becky, you know, we'll work with Richard and we're gonna be here next month, second Wednesday of the month. Pay okay. it forward, guys, pay it forward, please. Yes, sir. They're, they're in deep soup. Yeah. So their best bet is to get that. Um, their best is to, now. here's what you need to understand they're going to be faced with disclosing what is not legally required yet, except for the seller's disclosure. All right. That's one element. The second element is the flood insurance rates are going to come out in April. And so social medias, you can expect that's going to be talked about a little bit and what the rates are. So, everybody's going to be more conscious of that impact on their individual home. And we should too. We're, let's let's, let's uh, let Becky uh, tell you how you're gonna get uh, the, that information on, on the slides. And then we'll go and asking some questions, but we're gonna go with the mics because we're also recording this. They're doing a Facebook Live for Quest. Uh, we're recording this on, and they cannot hear you. So we're gonna pass the mics. Just raise your hand, and we'll we'll go around. Becky and I, okay. Becky and I will go around to pass you the mic for the questions. Uh, while you're while you're waiting or thinking about that, if you want to get the slides, if you go to realestateiq.co/survey-b, it's a short survey with a few questions, and then it lets you enter your contact information, and it'll ask you if you want the slides. And so all you have to do is say yes, and you will get them. If you would rather uh, have a paper copy that you can write on instead of doing that on your phone, we have some of those as well that I just dropped. But I yeah, if you want to ask questions, raise your hand. We go with the mics. What is the city so what is the city going to do? Because a lot of this has to do with that impermeable surfaces, and they're just been developing so much that there is no place for water to go. So we didn't get to get into it, but the new friend of the city is not slab on grade. It's pier and beam. And the logic is they can hold a little bit of water under that house, 
and it'll take it a little while before it goes downstream to somebody else. So they are going to really favor, have already begun to really favor Pier and Bean. There are a lot of beautiful houses built Pier and Bean. No, that's a requirement of the city for the building. Right, but it's going to cost the building money. So where is the money for the, the city needs to be doing something as well. No, the individual is going to be paying for that in the purchase of the house. Just like they had to pay for it, it whatever just, else. You just have to add it to your cost. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's not going to come from the city. That's a that's an illusion. The, the, the resilient project is a different issue. So it's where the city is coming in to, to yeah. help. But they need to do their part too. They can't just push all of this on everybody. It's going to bankrupt a lot of people. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Like you said, there's a lot of people that can't even afford solutions. Cool. We're trying to get more resources. We're uh, reaching out to the to the city. We're doing a lot of things that uh, we'll probably have a, a couple more people helping uh, answering some questions next month as well. So, um, if you get an elevation certificate that shows that your the property is at 500 plus two, or can you rest assured that you are going to be out of this? crazy thing with the insurance no and remember why. we're gonna do a drawing if you want to wait a couple more minutes they're remapping so yes according to date to today's maps but today's maps are wrong or people like me would not have flooded Yes, sir. You pointed that out to me. Yep. Did you hear the gentleman talk about subsidence? A lot like an A-leaf. Uh, I worked on a house 20 years ago, and it, uh, subsidence had dropped five feet. And that's when they quit pumping water out from underneath uh, Houston and started going with groundwater only. Yeah, question. Uh, do you see this happening in other cities or has it already happened in other cities in the nation or is it just Houston uh, starting with the Houston? You mentioned that. My that understanding is part of the template that the city used was New Orleans. And then um, they used some cities in other parts of the world for some of the solutions. Part of what's coming is what's called a resiliency project where they will, for instance, they have bought the Inwood Forest Golf Course. And the Inwood Forest Golf Course has been funded, I have it in the slide, it's either, I think it's 48 million, and it's already funded. So the purpose of the Inwood Golf Course is to turn it into a reservoir like the George Bush, the Barker Reservoir. So what they do, some of these projects are des designed to take as many as 100,000 houses out of the problem. And that's already in motion. There's multiple projects that have already been funded. But we didn't get to get into that tonight. Yeah, uh, next month we'll, we're going to have more information. I think this is going to be a really good uh, piece of information for everybody. Yes, ma'am. Out in northern Harris County, the Raven Oak Country Club has been bought by the MUD. That area is going to be turned into a detention pond to save Preston Wood and Champions Forest and some other areas up there. I love learning stuff I didn't learn. That's great. They're, they're really working in a lot of the creeks and a lot of uh, places so they can mitigate some of the issues. So um, that's where the city is putting their money and they're, they're really working. They called us, uh, I think it was somebody was here, in, in, uh, they invited developers, big developers, to, to look into how, because they need to move the money. So they, the city, uh, federal money, and the county were working together to see where they were going to put this money for for projects so the city is doing you know in their part they have to work with with a 
three different entities in order to to move that money but they have they do have a lot of money they cannot hand it out to the people but they do use it in a way that helps a lot a lot of people a lot of citizens no and, and next month I'm, that's what i'm talking about we didn't have enough time so we're gonna be talking more about the resilient the projects he is doing things along in cooperation with state and federal government and they funded remember i said earlier i was going to connect some of the money and what that's doing but i res respectfully I, I just this is too much to try to and it was a lot as it is hi i'm rachel with inverse nightmares llc and i wanted to know how can you mentioned that we might need to get more involved to get our government to increase our funding how would we go about doing something like that which what would you suggest so the smallest form of government is the precinct level and it begins there in our form of government influence begins at the smallest precinct and then it goes to the county level the decisions at the precinct level, the request for change begin at the precinct level and they carry up to county government. And then if it needs to go to state, it's kind of like a chain of command, a, an appeal process. And I've been involved in some of that stuff since the 70s. And um, it's amazing how a few people can actually impact for good and this is a situation that probably is not going to get a lot of pushback because of the size of the need and the community recognition of the problem and the need for the solution so that's part of why with our mission we would like we'd like to understand where people's problems are and then we'd like to find some solutions and connect the dots. So anybody who can contribute that would connect that would be great. Yes, but it can be at your precinct level. I don't mean your county commissioner. I mean the precinct. You're the precinct chairman for whatever party you're involved with in your precinct. So like, like there are commissioners for each of the precincts. That's, Correct. That's what I'm talking about. Correct. That's a level up. Yeah. Thank you, Richard, yes, for the Bobby. information. Question, uh, if you don't have a mortgage, are you obligated to have a flood insurance on the new standard, new law? If you self-insure, that will, and, and I've actually had discussions with guys who said, look, Richard, I own that property free and clear. Why don't I self-insure? You can. Thank you. But that's a smaller list. Is it worth it? So, I mean, uh, I I had three properties during Harvey that floated. One wasn't that bad, but two and two of them I lost money. And we started, and one that we had just purchased, Stina here now, um, it was a ARB $1.2 million, and we purchased it like a month before, and we we let the seller stay on it, uh, f you know, for two months. And it was by Highway 6 and Briar Forest. We are shaking, right? I mean, uh, so we're calling the guy like every few hours, how are you doing? Like, stop, guys, and like, we're fine. And fortunately, that one didn't float, but two of them floated. One, I'm just selling it just now. It cost me, um, we were losing money. We were supposed to make $70,000 we're going to end up losing 30 something thousand dollars on it uh and and from that point on we go like even if it's not in the in a flood plane 400 dollars a month 500 dollars or a year I, i'm i'm all my houses have flood insurance now uh, i was talking to a friend of mine he was a he's actually an engineer one of the um, uh, consultant for the city and he says what do you think they do with the, the maps you think they know what there's what's going to happen they're guessing they're using algorithms they're using math and they come up with a flood play and then we we get a harvey and they go oh shoot we messed up let's change it and then we get a million and they go oh shoot we you know we have to change it again 
it's, it's a guessing game. It's not really, I mean, nobody can really predict that, right? So we are, we are playing a game. We are trying to, to do an educated guess with the information we have. And Richard has been really good at gathering all this information and we're working on a lot of things and we can only play by the rules, right? I mean, if the city says, this is the floodplain, is it? Well, maybe not, but we have to play by those rules. So if the city says that you're in a floodplain, you're in a floodplain and your insurance takes that and charge you four, six, say $9,000 more a year. So it's about knowing and how we can benefit from it, right? So why, why is these planes, the floodplains, they always change? They always change. Absolutely. Yes. And, and another thing I would like to illustrate so that we would have some compassion on our city officials. I can tell you that there will be people who will inflame emotional people to deal with this in an emotional way instead of a calm, how do we figure this out kind of thing. I've, I've seen it all my, all my life. I would like to illustrate an engineer friend of mine, long time friend, high level in charge of identifying certain areas that are supposed to flood. He said, Richard, he said, with some of this stuff, we have no mathematical model, we have no computer model, we have no kind of model that will explain why there was eight foot of water in this particular house. And that's the dilemma they face. So yes, it's, it's not perfect. With the new technology, it's going to be the best it's ever been in history. That's how good it is. But it's not here yet. Yes, Fabio. So what if I buy a house under the 100 year floodplain and then it, it is um, pure and beam, which is easier to raise, and then yeah. I raise it about the 500 year plus two, then do I get away from paying? No flood insurance. Okay. Yeah, so those become, so you just identified an opportunity just like we Pure and beam, yeah. That's one of the ones we identified. We can buy things like that and raise them. Uh, and we are looking, so bank. what Richard was talking about, we are looking into resources and we are interviewing, we're talking to other people and Richard was encouraging everybody. So for questions, for helping somebody, for, for solutions too. If you guys said, you know what? I mean, think about it. We were talking about this. If we become one like franchise type and we go to an engineering company and we say, hey, what if we can get you 100 houses to elevate? Would you give us a better rate, right? Would, will that work? And instead of charging you $130,000, we'll do it for 60. Well, then we become a part of one, one entity, right? So let's go through us and, and let's do this together, right? So it could, it could work in, in a, a lot of different directions if we work together and we, and we find different solutions. What if we get them like by, you know, like different ways? So come, come up with solutions too. Come up with ideas, come up with different things that we can collaborate together. So the idea was, yes, let's inform everybody. Let's give them this knowledge. Let's pass this information. It's, it's, it's no secret. So Richard said it in the beginning of the presentation, I'm a, I'm a parrot, right? Like I'm just repeating information that is out there. But how many of you have really sit down and, and put a few hours into doing this research, all right? So bringing it out, there is nothing new. It's public information, but it's presenting it in a way that is, uh, you know, like we can assimilate it, we can benefit from it. But let's, as Richard said, let's pass it along, let's work together, let's see what we can do together. Okay, just to clarify, if you go to realestateiq.co slash survey B, you can, enter, you can answer as many of those questions as you want. There's 10 questions, you can skip them or whatever. At the bottom, it'll ask you if you want a copy of the slides. So if you put yes and put your contact information, you will get them. If you have one of these, put your contact information at the bottom, write slides. 
leave it on the table on your way out and we'll make sure you get the slides that way as well. All right, we have three prizes to give away tonight. You have to be present to win. So those that do, left, those that left are out. The rest of you have more a chances chance. for everyone else. Okay, so the first one I have is a twenty-five dollar Outback gift card. So if somebody wants needs a Valentine's dinner. Okay, the last four digits are nine two eight five. Nine two eight five. Awesome. A winner. Right, thank you. <laughs> Chicken or steak, whichever. Okay, the second one is for three free months of the Real Estate IQ Deal Analysis Suite or $45 off another package. And the last four digits are 9222. 9222. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> <laughs> one, nine two 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 once. going once twice they left let's okay, do another one pull another one last four are nine two nine seven nine two nine seven going going gone Nine two nine four. Nine two nine four. <laughs> I don't have it. <laughs> there uh, it is. All right, awesome. And the next one. And the last one. Derek said he would come back, which he didn't. Is but one, I'm gonna one give it ticket away anyway. for the for the workshop for a quest? Yes, one ticket to the quest boot camp. Thank you that they have coming up. It's Derek. Yes, yeah, since I'm giving it away, <laughs> I give away 10 of them. <laughs> All right, this ends in 9249. 9249. Nope. Going once, <laughs> going twice. Nine, two, nine, three. <laughs> All right, we have a winner. Make sure I get your I get your contact information and then I'll give it I'll pass Please it. let's give Richard a big, big thank you. stand up and applause. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, Richard. And see you guys next month. Don't forget next month sign up with a meetup or sign with a Facebook or sign on Real Estate IQ. Thank you. So I would like to talk to you, I know. Sure. I'll go on your website. I'll... Yeah, I did. <laughs> I was supposed to have cladology cards with me today per my my team, but no, I didn't do that. That's the owner finance program. Okay, thanks, Tony. Okay. Yeah, I've got a property I may have to uh, get rid of. Uh, no. Uh, well above harvest. But I don't know what that means. But uh, the house is old. I needed to say. Right. And, uh, it's in pretty sad shape. And they've got it, I think the improvements are down to 60,000. That's at least what it'll take to fix it up. So, so how I mean, is the ARV? Uh, probably at least uh, 260, and maybe more. Oh, yeah. 
I want you to one of those. So the tools I showed you from what I go on those links and plug it in. You should have an idea directly.